Well, we're really glad you're here. Uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes kind of laying out the program for you as you consider um, uh, kind of making the commitment that's, uh, that it's going to take, I think, in order for this to be successful for you and uh, talk to you about a few things and give you a few challenges and then get into tonight's teaching. Uh, so that's, uh, that's our goal tonight. Let me just touch base real quickly on the, on the title of the um, title of the study here is Rebuilding the Walls, 52 Days to a Healthier Christian Life. As I was studying and reading Nehemiah, which is an, an incredible book, especially the first seven or eight chapters are just a, a remarkable book. It's a remarkable story, and we'll probably visit, maybe visit even a little bit more uh, tonight as well. But to summarize the story, and as I was reading it, um, the, uh, the it, it's near, matter of fact, Nehemiah, if, if the Old Testament was laid out, the books were laid out chronologically, it would be the last book in the Old Testament, okay? So that's the very last thing that happens. After this, there's 400 years where there's nothing recorded, according to our Bibles. Uh, there's nothing, not much recorded. Of course, some of the, uh, the Catholic Bibles have what's called intertestamental books, but we don't, uh, they're not part of the, our, so to speak, canon. And um, so nothing happens, and then Jesus comes. So the importance of the events of this book, I think, are strategic for that event, for, for that reason alone. So, uh, so if it was laid out chronologically, it'd be the very last thing that would be recorded. So what is it that happened in this book of Nehemiah, and why was it so important? Well, about 50 years before this book, uh, the Jews, well, I'm sorry, more than that, probably 70 to, 70 to 100 years before this book, the Jews over a period of time had been led off to, into captivity, and they'd ended up eventually, in, uh, the, the final tribes, Judah and Israel, were finally led off into captivity, and they, them, they also uh, became essentially captive nations. Now, when a nation is led off to captivity, they don't necessarily take every single person. Uh, there's always a remnant left, there's always some people, but they always get the leaders, they get the influential people, they get the educators, they get the business people, and their families, and if they can, they split them up and send them all over and try to essentially destroy a culture. But there's always a remnant of people left in the land, you know, the, the people that, you know, probably like some farmers and not the rich people, but just people that are kind of there. So there's, there's always a remnant of people, correct? Does that make sense? So... There was always a remnant of, uh, of Jews in Israel, even though they had been carried off into captivity. Now, about 50 years before the occasioning of this event here, um, Zerubbabel had uh, got a passion to go back to Jerusalem because it was still kind of a city, but nothing like it had been in its glory days. You know, the, the matter of fact, um, we... Um, talked a little bit about King David on Sunday, and then King David uh, basically founded Jerusalem, but it was his son Solomon and the other uh, uh, grandsons and whatnot that came after him, but especially Solomon, that took Israel to its glory days. Solomon is the one who built the temple, and the temple that Solomon built was a spectacular temple. It was uh, it, it was it was probably probably the most expensive structure that had ever been built to that point in time, and maybe even to this day. I mean, the beauty of it, the way they talk about it, the tradition is is just phenomenal. But um, as Israel declined in power, uh, when you if you're going to tear apart a city, you would completely tear it down. Uh, and so let's say the temple, I don't remember how tall it is, I think it's about three stories high at its highest peak. It was gold inlaid almost everywhere on the outside. You, it, was just, it was just a glistening, is a beautiful structure in a, in a beautiful city. But as, uh, as Israel uh, uh, degraded over time, and, uh, and invaders came in, is that eventually took the, took the city increasingly apart. They especially tore the temple apart because the temple was said to have gold even used as mortar between the big stones. So part of the reason they told, tore those things apart was to get every bit of value that was in the temple. So the temple 
uh, was completely demolished. And, and, uh, and as a sign that a city was completely destroyed, they would, they would also tear down any walls around a city. Now, we'll come back to that in just a second. So Zerubbabel, about 50 years before, had decided that even though Jerusalem was not a powerhouse, it was still a city, there was people living there, that he had gotten permission to go back and rebuild a form of the temple. It wasn't the glorious temple that Solomon built, but nonetheless, it was a temple. The thing he did not do, though, is he did, did not rebuild the walls around the city. And so when Nehemiah comes on the scene, he's heard stories from people that have been traveling throughout the region. He'd heard about the fact of, of how beautiful that Israel had been at one time, probably from his grandparents or great-great-grandparents, and how spectacular it had been. He'd read the stories. He had seen the scrolls, of course, and all that kind of stuff. And he hears, he hears that, his, uh, that his home nation's primary city is without walls and it broke his heart so he asked for permission from his king and he said can i go and investigate it and when he when he when he got to jerusalem there were remnant jews living there and there was a lot of other bands of people living there there was other cultures that had developed in the area uh, but jerusalem was nothing like it nothing like it had been even though now there was a place of worship there was a temple there um but the walls were torn down, and it broke his heart. It broke his heart that, that the city that he loved, the great city that the Lord was so uh, passionate and loved so much, that, it was, that the, the walls around the city were destroyed. Now, you guys, have, if you've been around the church much at all, I'm sure you've heard me say it before. What is significant for that, uh, at that point in history, what is significant about the walls around a city being torn down? What's significant about that? Somebody want to take a shot at it? It's defenseless. Good. You want to add anything to that, Jane? No, I don't. Okay. Sm <laughs> smart move. All right. Uh, if, if the walls, if your city had no ability to protect itself, either the gates are down. There was 11 sets of gigantic dates, gates around the city of Jerusalem. If either the gates don't work or they're out or the walls have breaches in them, or they're torn down. Essentially what you're saying is that our people are open to anything that comes its way. Any, any ill-intentioned people, it's, it's open to uh, any sort of weather. It's more exposed to weather. It's more exposed to animals. Uh, there's basically then no control over the city. Anything, yeah, exposed to everything, yeah. And uh, I think it's Proverbs 29, 18. We'll probably get to it tonight here someplace. Proverbs 20, 19 says, Like a city without walls is a man who has no control over his own spirit. And, and, and as, I start to, 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 as I started to read through uh, this passage of Scripture, I, I really felt like the Lord uh, spoke to me about connecting with Nehemiah's passion in a way that relates to our culture. And, uh, and, and when, he came, when he went back to his king, he said, said, I believe God's called me to go back and rebuild the walls. He, he got permission from the king. He got resources from the king. He got uh, people. He got money. He, got, he took a lot of wealth. The king really blessed him. And he goes back to Jerusalem to convince the remnant of Jews that were there. He probably took thousands of people as well, took, took them back to reestablish the city. You know, not as many had been there at one time. Probably at Jerusalem at one time was a city of at least a million people. I mean, it was busy, right? There's a lot of people. And uh, so, but he took back thousands of people, took back a lot of resources. And as he went back to his city of Jerusalem with one thing in mind, he went back with the intention of rebuilding the walls. And the work that they did of rebuilding the walls around the city of Jerusalem, rehanging, rebuilding and rehanging all the gates, was accomplished in 52 days. Not 52 years, not 52 months, 52 days. And uh, the, the remarkable, um, miraculous achievement that that, that was is... Uh, is incredible in every sense of the word. If the gates were, let's say they're at least 12 to 20 feet high, 
you can imagine how high the walls were. And if you're going to build a wall that's going to be 20 feet high, it's not going to be like just stone upon stone. Upon stone. I mean, it's going to be big and, and, and a lot. So there's a lot, a lot of lessons, I think, to be learned there. But the thing that the, the, that the Lord laid on my spirit is if they could, is if through the power of God, if they could rebuild, if they could structurally rebuild walls around a city in 52 days, why can't we rebuild our lives if we had a mind to work if we had a heart for action, why can't we rebuild our lives and see God do miraculous things in our hearts and our lives over, over a short period of time? And 52 days is a very short period of time, but, uh, but um, nonetheless, I felt like that's what the Lord spoke to me. And so that's where uh, all the lessons, the seven weeks of lessons here that are in this study, that's where all that came out of is that passion right there. So, uh, so that's why rebuilding the walls, 52 days to a healthier Christian life. One of my friends said one time, you know, in church we talk about rebuilding walls, tearing down walls, all doing, you know, and all kinds of things, you know, because the metaphors uh, have to fit what you're talking about. But in this case, we're talking about rebuilding the walls of your life, rebuilding the walls of your heart and your soul, rebuilding the walls of your personality, rebuilding the walls of your, of your, of your spiritual awareness and strength so that... You're not easy prey for anything that comes along. Are, are you with me? And the fact of the matter is, is most people are incredibly susceptible to any sort of, any sort of thing that comes along in their life. They're susceptible to false truth. I, Michael suggested that. You're susceptible to sin. You're susceptible to the lies of the enemy. If you don't have the appropriate protections in your life, and I think the protections in our life are primarily built by, by understanding and knowing the Word of God and knowing who and where to turn to in our lives. So that's the goal, and the challenge is, is in, is in uh, the next uh, 52 days is to really put yourself out there in your own personal walk with God and, uh, and, and look at some... Um, Matter of fact, it's, it's pretty much a, a global look at your life in terms of how you're functioning and how God's going to accomplish great things for your life. Does that make sense? All right. So, so that's where we're going in this. Uh, I don't know if you guys have had, had a chance to glance through the book yet, but you'll see that, that, that there's a lot there. There's a lot of action points. There's a lot of uh, opportunities to reflect. There's a lot of opportunities to respond. There's some very specific and strategic um, assignments in there that are, are not just casual things. They're things that we really thought and prayed through as we were assembling this and, uh, and thought about it uh, distinctly and directly. So, uh, so, so the class is sequential. Uh, in the sense that it builds from it builds from one lesson to another lesson. I laid it out that way. So you're going to start this week with very foundational things. My guess is this week will be almost by far the easiest week in terms of oh yeah I got that I got that I got that for most people. If you've been walking with the Lord for any time at all, just, it's going to be kind of an easy flow. But you get to the week we start to talk about emotions and uh, destiny and all that kind of stuff. It, you, you're going to hit some roadblocks. You know you're going to hit some shifts in your life. You're going to when we start to talk about obedience and some things, you know, you'll start to, you'll start to, to double clutch a little bit and reconsider uh, uh, what you're doing and why you're doing it. But, but uh, they are sequential and they, uh, and they build upon one another. Um, my preference, my strong preference, I think for people, because this would be about the fifth time I've taught it, people do best in this class if you just decide now that I'm going to make every week. I'm just going to change my schedule and make every week. Because if you decide you're going to make every week, I can guarantee you something's going to come up and you're going to miss one. If you decide you're going to miss one, you'll miss two or three. You know. So if my suggestion to you is just, just decide now that, you know what, I'm going to be here every week and I'm not going to miss it. I'm going to, I'm going to make it a priority. I'm going to overcome my bad mood and traffic and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to get here, be here ready to go, and, uh, and just commit to being here. That being said, uh, my, my, uh, uh, my basic 
uh, encouragement to you is that if you're pretty sure you can make at least five out of the seven, I would absolutely do the class, I would do, and I would do it with me teaching it. If you think, man, I'm going to be lucky to make four, this may not be the time for you to be a part of it, because I really want you to get the maximum benefit uh, out of the time together. So that's for you to know. That's not, I can't make that call for you. No, there's no condemnation uh, for any of us. By the way, Josh, it seems slightly stuffy in here to me. Is, are they working on that? Okay. Can we open these doors here and, and at least get some air flowing through there? Um, is Chris doing something about that? Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, so my, uh, my, my preference would be is, is if you can uh, really think about getting here and then, and then really commit to saying that no matter what, I'm going to be here and that, that you're reasonably sure that at least five out of the seven you can make. I will tell you that we are recording them and... Um, we can probably put them online so you could catch up. Uh, I do have shortened versions of what you're going to get already online, and I can connect you with those. So you could get what we use when we taught it in our small groups, when I did it by like our DVD teaching. Those are online. Uh, they're five years old. You can see I'm still just as good looking as I was five years ago. I did have a goatee back then, which uh, nobody ever saw until I shaved it off. It's kind of like, did you change something? But anyway, it just kept getting wider and wider the last five years. Um, and... Um, uh, what was I saying? So anyway, so so we probably can load them online, and if you if you you know you really want to be here, you can't make it. You know we probably can get it up sometime during the week. I'll have to ask Chris about that. I don't think it's a real big deal. It just takes some time to to load it up onto Vimeo or something like that, which I think has has the most part. So so that's just one thing for you to consider. I would really like for you to really consider that. So as you're thinking about that, turn to. Turn to page uh, 8. All right. Turn to page 8. And let me tell you about how to make this a successful journey together, and then we'll back up and I'll revisit the introduction with you. If anybody needs a pen, Amanda's here. We have our amazing orange cause pens. Raise your hand if you need one. Okay. Okay, so uh, number one, commit to your own spiritual health by making the decision to be persistent, tenacious in weekly attendance and in the daily exercises. There's something to be done almost every day. Um, and, uh, and, and I would really encourage you is don't let that stuff build up on you because then you're going to be driving here, driving in the car, you know, and texting your friends and trying to figure out how you're going to meet them and try to fill in the blanks. And uh, I just encourage you just be tenacious on that. Just you've, you've got, you need to make it a priority. Um, number two, pray daily at least 15 minutes. You cannot rebuild walls on your own. You have probably tried that already. You need God's help, protection, and provision. Remember, we are re rebuilding walls of your soul and spirit, not processing information. We're committed at our church to transformational experiences, not educational transmission of, of information. Now, I can't make that happen, but that's our goal. And if you're going to embrace something of change in your life, you can't do it on your own. You're going to have to open yourself up to the Lord. And so I'd really, really ask for his help and his assistance. Say, say Lord, give me the energy. Give me the passion. Give me the, give me the time. Help me to be uh, disciplined in this and, and press on. Number three, uh, take the action point seriously. When was the last time you actually acted on faith? The challenges are designed to build spiritual strength. Take the action steps uh, seriously. And those are uh, anywhere from incredibly easy to a, a little bit challenging. And just depends on your personality and who you are as a person. Okay, number four. Let me talk to you about this. Identify a spiritual buddy. Say buddy. buddy. Prayer partner, accountability mate. I don't really care what you call the person. Just get somebody with whom you can share, pray, and relate to for the next 52 days. I expect you to communicate at least twice a week for the next seven weeks. Now, I'm going to adjust this slightly. Here's, I got a couple rules on this, but tonight, uh, if you're pretty sure that you're going to commit to this before you leave tonight, I'm going to uh, insist that you connect with uh, two spiritual buddies. I'm going to break you up into groups of three, all right? And, uh, and so I'm going to, I'll, I'll, let me go ahead and talk through that right now. 
I have found that if there's even a little bit of accountability and a little bit of encouragement from somebody, it makes a really big difference. And if you're going to uh, elicit change in your life, you can't keep doing what you've already always done. You have to do something different, okay? So uh, tonight before we leave, uh, we're going to break into two groups. We're going to break into a group of men and a group of women. Uh, and uh, your, your, uh, your buddies cannot be somebody you're married to, can't be somebody you're living with. Uh, they need to be somebody, it can be a really good friend, but you're just not somebody you're married to or somebody you're living with. And, um, uh, and just exchange uh, either emails or phone numbers or both. And the only reason to do this, and I'll, I'll revisit this as well, the only reason to do this is strictly for encouragement. I'm not asking you to counsel each other. I'm not asking you to teach each other. I'm not asking you to, uh, you know, all of a sudden have the best friend in your life. I am asking you to consider just somebody that, that sometime during the week you're going to send an email or a text or pick up the phone, and if Robert was my buddy, say, Robert, hey, I just want to let you know I'm praying for you. Hey, we're on day three. How you doing? And he'd say, I'm doing good. Thanks for the call. And that's it. Say, I'm not going to call Robert. Say, Robert, I just got to tell you, man, Sherry's just driving me crazy. Do you have a half an hour, all right? I'm not going to do that, right? Are, are you with me? So it's not about counseling. It's just somebody to just encourage you. It's just going to be a group, uh, 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 somebody to encourage you. I don't care who you connect with. I know for some of you guys, you're already saying, then I'm out, you know. I just encourage you to press through that because it won't be, uh, won't be, it'll be a real positive thing and not a legalistic um, sort of uh, a weight on your back. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Now, number five, how to be successful in this. Teach the principles that you start to learn to at least one person. The best way to ingrain, ingrain truths into your being is to put them into practice and teach them to somebody else. So um, every week, I would like you to take one concept and teach it to somebody who's not in this group. Okay, so just sit down and have a conversation with somebody like one of the things we're going to talk about in a few minutes is the assurance of salvation. You ought to be able to sit down and talk with somebody and say, did you know that, you can, that, that, that God wants you to know that you're saved, that he doesn't want you worrying about your salvation? It just, just teach it to somebody. That when you teach something to somebody else is when you really learn it. Until that time, you're just going to be processing information. Again, we're going for transformation. Does that make sense? So, uh, so don't have Wendy come, and you can teach her, you know, so that'd be perfect. And then um, the last one is, is, is something that when I wrote this, we hadn't been doing in our church, but I write, begin a spiritual journal to record the personal, maybe even private activities that God and you are working on. And I believe the last, oh, 15 pages or so of the book would could do that for you now if you have your dna journals that that the church uses yeah i don't think you need to do both okay so the last pages here they're just daily journal pages if you can excuse me write something that you're learning does that make sense see that they're all just blank line pages that's what that's for okay i'm not talking about a diary you know we're not in junior high no offense if there's any junior hires here I'm not trying to offend anybody um and uh but it's not about you know you know, saying, you know, did you hear what so-and-so said, you know, and boy, I feel so bad about this. Uh, it's not any of that kind of stuff. It's truly, it's truly just a reflecting on what God's speaking to you. I'm using my DNA journal for that, so I don't think we need to do something else. So then uh, tonight is as you, as you believe that God's called you to be a part of this. You, you know, so I'm going to go for it. You know, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to, I, my intention is to be there every week. I would like you to sign this covenant. Keep it. It's state, keep it in your book. It's on page 9. It reads this way. Heavenly Father, today I make the decision to rebuild the walls of my soul and spirit. I need your help. I cannot do it on my own. My heart's desire is to live a productive, healthy, vibrant life for you. I see myself as joyful, peaceful, full of energy, and loving toward others. My mind is clear, my emotions balanced, and my body dedicated to serving you. I commit to the regular daily habits that form the foundation for a healthy life. 
Fill me with your Holy Spirit more completely than I've ever known before in Jesus' name, and then sign that. And uh, again, I'm not, this is your, this is your book, this is your manual, I'm not going to check, but if I were you, there's something about signing your name to something that says, I'm in, I'm committed. Until then, you know, we're always, you kind of have one foot out and reconsidering things all the time, so, um, so, that's some tips and some ideas about how to do things. Now, let me stop there. Do you have any questions about anything I've said so far? Kristen? No, and you're actually not going to break into a group. All you're going to do... No, I'm talking about the spiritual thing. I, uh, like when you're at co-parking, the accountability. The accountability, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? If you want to, you can. Yeah, I'm not going to, I don't really, I, my advice to you is to get with somebody that you're not married to, you know. <laughs> you're actually closer to her. You have your, you have her DNA, not his, you know, and um, uh, you guys can do what you want, but, but I'll explain that one more time. So I, I don't want this, uh, probably if, some, if I was sitting where you guys were sitting, somebody told me that, I'd go, oh, crud, that'd be my first reaction, you know. But usually what I find is that when I say, oh, crud, is usually when the most valuable things happen for me, you know. So, and again, um, uh, when I've done it, the times I've done it with people, it's always been a positive thing. I've gotten to know a couple guys a little bit better, and I get to pray for people and just encourage them, you know. So it's a very simple, it's not counseling. I'm not talking about phone calls. I'm not talking about being rude. It's not talking about 1 o'clock in the morning. No, I'm drunk. Come pick me up, you know. <laughs> Call somebody else, you know. Um, it's true, I've gotten those calls before, you know, so that's, um, anyway, so, so, so hopefully that will bless you. Yes? You did not understand that correctly. Yeah, man. But if, if you do, you would win some sort of prize, you know. So none, um, the, uh, the, the, the actual, the, the, uh, the process is 52 days long starting today, but we're going to meet seven times every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, and we'll go about an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, so we'll, hopefully you'll be on your way if you want to be on your way by, by about 8.15, so it won't be too long. And, and I usually start right on time. Tonight I gave it a few more minutes just because people are registering, but, but uh, usually I start, like I wa if I walk in at 7, we'll start talking right at 7, only out of respect to those of you that uh, uh, are here on time, and it's no disrespect to people that are fighting the traffic at all. So, Okay, any other questions about anything I've said so far in terms of the logistics? Seriously, no questions? Yes, Mary. Yes. Could be anybody you want to. Yeah, it could be just somebody not in the class. So you could just grab Lee at night and say, hey, look at this, look what I've learned. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's just to get it out of here through here. When stuff passes through the lips or through the fingertips is when it becomes reality. You know, so you want to get it out of here and getting it moving, getting it moving. That's why you journal. That's why you speak is you get things moving. So sound good? All right. Was there another question? No. Very good. Okay. Uh, the, turn back to me then at, at the introduction. Uh, and let me just kind of roll through this, and then we'll touch base on the days coming up this week and, uh, and accomplish our, our stuff together. The most exciting day of your life is the moment of realization that God loves you. God really loves you, men and women. And, and man, if you haven't got that yet, uh, I hope uh, that this week you get is how much the Lord loves you. He really does. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people that think that church is only about how unhappy God is with us, and that certainly is in his heart. That's kind of a distortion of, of uh, being too religious, you know, and the reality is God really, God really does love us. Every other decision, relationship, or endeavor takes on a whole new perspective after giving your life to Jesus. The Lord comes into your heart, uh, or our heart, you could go either way, and begins the process of making a life out of the mess we've created. Not only do we settle the issue of our eternity with him, but he promises to give us life here and now and to give it to us abundantly. Next paragraph. The Bible says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his purpose. What God is working in you, complete righteousness and perfection, is your responsibility to begin working out. You can do it. 
add your effort to his promise to will and work, act in you, and you have the key ingredients to building a life of adventure and fulfillment. Have any of you ever heard the term, Jesus saves? If you haven't heard that, you haven't been keeping your eyes open, you know, or your ears open. Jesus saves, and when we talk about salvation, um, most evangelical-minded people, which is like most of us in this room, our first thought is about eternity, and that's absolutely true. But in Jesus's, uh, in, in the way that Jesus spoke about it, and the way the New Testament, New Testament speaks about it, and the word salvation doesn't just mean that if you if you put up with this life and don't sin too much, that when you get to eternity, it's all going to be good. What the word salvation literally means is that he's saving you right now from the destructive things of the enemy, the curses that, that he has on this planet. He's rescuing you right now. So that's when Jesus says the thief comes to kill, 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 steal, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He's not just talking about eternal life. He's talking about life here and now. And if you start to understand that in terms of salvation, which may Maybe a lot of you guys get that. If Once you start to get that, you understand that when we're talking about being saved, I'm not talking about just a confession of faith that is the, 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 the signature that gets me into heaven. We're talking about a salvation that sets me free from the things that are, that are, that are pulling me down now, the, the curse of the enemy against my life. Does that make sense? Does that help as you think about salvation a little bit? Next paragraph, it would be nice if we lived in a world where everything was orderly and compliant, neat and organized, clean and sanitized, but that is unrealistic on this planet. As beautiful as God has made our earth, and as much as he loves us, we usually operate on the edge of chaos. Our lives are all too often on the brink of collapse. He wants to free us from the bondages we have embraced and set our feet on a new path. He is willing, are you? You may think that your life is too much of a disaster, that you have lived a certain lifestyle for so long that it cannot be changed or affected in any meaningful way. As a matter of fact, you may feel that you are vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy, instead, and instead of experiencing an abundant life, you see the devil still kill and destroy any good work in you. God has a better plan for you. We know that God can take your mess and turn it into a message, turn your test into a testimony, and you will no longer be the tail but the head. Rebuilding your life is not easy work, but it is not impossible either. I hope you get that. Just because you've, you've made a mess of your life and you've done it for a long time, it doesn't mean that you have to stay that way. That's a lie of the enemy. And, and I know most of us have certain vulnerabilities, certain things that we're susceptible to, certain things that we're more vulnerable to. Let me give you guys this illustration real quick. This might make sense. I, I, I don't drink. I never have drank. The only, the only alcohol I've ever had has either been at a toast uh, or something like that. You know, I would, I would not purposely be rude in a situation but I just don't drink. So for me to drive down Lambert or to drive down Central or to drive down Brea Boulevard and, and I'm aware that there's all these restaurants, there's taps, I mean to, to go into B, to, uh, uh, BJ's and they, they're going to offer you the seven beers and all that kind of stuff or, or um, to me it is absolutely, it is zero temptation to me whether or not I'm going to drink too much. You know, I don't worry about it. I don't worry about my favorite. I don't worry about a favorite liquor store becoming a temptation to me. I mean, I don't even think about it. But the guys and the gals I've known that are that that have at their point in life had significant trouble with alcohol, maybe become alcoholics, maybe come out of it. For them, they literally break into a cold sweat if they were to drive past certain bars or if they go past certain happy hour times. You know, because everything within them is connected to, to, to some sort of vulnerability in their life, to some sort of moment in their life. Well, that's not, a, it's not any sort of temptation that I have, even a little bit. It's not even, it's not even a, a little bit of an issue for me. You know, but just because somebody has, you know, we all have different sort of vulnerabilities, but just because you've had that doesn't mean that you can't break free from that and, and put your life on a better track. Maybe, maybe you get angry easy. Maybe you uh, say too much, you know, maybe your mouth just flies off and you're constantly getting yourself in trouble, you know. Maybe you're not as loyal as you should be. Maybe you're, you're not as, uh, as uh, committed. Any number of different things you can have, right? All right, let's go on. Um, 
so it's not a, uh, rebuilding your life requires intensity and focus. Great accomplishments are achieved with faith and a mind to work. Let me illustrate this point. Story of Nehemiah recording in the Old Testament reveals how the per passion of one man ignited the resources of a government and the energy of a nation to accomplish a great feat in a short amount of time. And I've told you this story. He went to King Artaxerxes, uh, talked about the, the, the uh, walls coming down. Uh, Jerusalem's walls um, were in ruin. Invaders had complete access to it. I told you all this stuff, right? Um, let me, let me uh, about the middle page. But what was, was most critical was that the temple itself was totally vulnerable. We didn't touch base on that one, I don't think. This was the temple of God, the place where Jehovah lived, so to speak. The defenses of the city were non-existent, making the Israelites a laughing stock among the neighboring nations. Israel, which only a few days, few decades prior had been the strongest nation on the planet, with the wealthiest people in history, a nation dedicated to serving the Lord, was now a pitiful shadow of a once a mighty and proud people. The temple was vulnerable. And if, and, and, and if you make the connection once again, the Bible says that you are the temple of what? Of the Holy Spirit. And when, there are, when there's brokenness in your life, things that you continue not to deal with, instead of the presence of God growing in your life, it continues to get muffled and sedated and restricted. Because what's housing the presence of God is so vulnerable to weakness and, and brokenness. Yeah? So uh, what we're talking about is really moving our life forward in a powerful way. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to say it. That'd definitely be a very scriptural way to say it. Sure, Michael. Um, I misquoted the, the verse. Proverbs 25, 28 says, Like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. Too many of us are trying to live a life pleasing to God while completely defenseless. This, the wall of our soul is in disrespe disrepair, and subsequently our temple is completely vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. Anything, um, anything or anybody that comes along seems to affect us and rob us of our joy and peace. This is not God's plan for you. He promises his peace, joy, hope, and love are ours. But the enemy keeps trouncing in and robbing us. Just wave at me if you've ever experienced any of this at all. You know that you're something less than you're not experiencing all that God has for, you, for us. Why? Because our walls, are, our walls, our defenses are broken down. We're left without any self-control. Invaders are in control. Um, by the way, we don't... There's... If somebody has AIDS, it means that they have no immunity, right? And in a sense, so many of us have spiritual AIDS. The things that we should just be shaking off, that shouldn't be any big thing to us, that, that shouldn't even, shouldn't, it should be just like a fly, just like a fly on our back, you know, it's going to blow it off. Those things are completely making us sick and ill because we have no immunities. And God, if God's going to turn us into a kingdom of priests and prince and princesses, we've got to be a little bit stronger than we are. We've got to have more going for us than, than we do. And that's what, God, that's what God has for us. So that's what, that's what these seven weeks together should be about. Amen? Amen. All right. What did God empower Nehemiah to do about destroyed defenses? Through a series of miraculous events, Nehemiah was commissioned by the king to return to Jerusalem with workers and resources to rebuild the walls. Not everybody was thrilled with this passionate endeavor. Opposition to rebuilding the walls was immediate and persistent. But when a faithful man with a godly plan acts in obedience, a good work will ensue. I didn't touch on that, but as you read Nehemiah, he had Sanballat, Tobiah, and... Uh, Sanballat. There's one more. I can't think of the other guy's name. What is it? Uh, I don't know. Anyways, I could find it real quick. He had, in particular, three very loud voices that were not excited about the Israelites pursuing any good work. They weren't Jews, and they had no desire to see the Jews reestablish their rule and reign over the area. So they started off by just mocking it, saying, oh, you're never going to be able to do it. And then they moved from mocking it to actually uh, gathering a crowd of people to say, and start to threaten them, you know. And then they moved from threatening to a strategic plan to attack them and to stop the work. So I can guarantee you that as you start to do this, I know that there's going to be some things that are going to be mounted against you. You know, the enemy has no desire to see you be any more effective than you, are, than you already are. He'd rather see you uh, spiral down 
you know, the, or maintain rather than start to lift your life through the power of God. So I can guarantee you that you're going to, you're going to have sniffles, you know, you're going to, I call those healing crises, you know, you're going to have, you're going to have sniffles, you're going to have a uh, car breakdown, you're going to have frustration with somebody in your family, they're not going to, they're going to be irritated at you and all that kind of stuff. But I'm telling you, if you will, if you will press on through that and break through some of the, some, some of the enemy schemes and strategies, you will grow. You will grow. Amen? All right. Nehemiah envisioned Jerusalem not as it was with broken walls and burned gates, but as a beautiful city housing the temple of God with its defenses restored and intact. Others may look at you and only see a disaster that looks like the results of a personality earthquake. But the Almighty sees a, a gorgeous temple dedicated to serving him and his people. Do you want to remain a city defenseless, or are you willing to work for something better? That's kind of a cool thought. What did Nehemiah see? He saw a restored Jerusalem, something the people would be proud of. He saw walls surrounding. He saw the gates rehung, which was no small deal. He saw something of significance. And when God looks at your life, that's exactly how he sees you. You know, he sees you rising above the circumstances. He really does, you know. And, and it may not be, you know, when we think of that, so many times we start to think about some sort of public thing. It may not be a public thing. That's not the issue. The issue is the solidity of your soul, you know, and your ability to, uh, to live like God wants you to live. All right. The Bible says that once Nehemiah shared his vision and plan with the people, th that the people began this good work. That's e uh, Nehemiah 2.18. Of their work, the word indicates the people worked with their heart and that they had a mind to work. So two things. You've got to have a heart to work and a mind to work. A heart to work and a mind to work. The project was fraught with challenges and enemies, but through prayer and effort, a miraculous rebuilding of the walls took place not in 52 years, 52 months, or even 52 weeks, but in 52 days. Now look at this. The stones did not just jump back into place, and the gates did not reattach themselves to their walls. No, it took incredible effort, but what the historian said should have taken decades was accomplished in 52 days. Did you catch that? It's not just because, you know, what we really want this to happen, that, it, that things changed. It had nothing to do with, you know, gosh, this would be really nice if this happened. It had to do with people that had a heart and a mind to work. One of the things that I, I don't know if we'll talk about it much, but do you know they had to clear away the rubble before they could even start the work? That's a whole different story right there. You know, and, uh, Keith. To build? <laughs> well, Keith was our contractor here and did an incredible job. So we took at least 150 days, right? Five months, Five months from about August through January. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The We're, that's exactly right. You've got to you got to clear stuff out. In our case, when and I'm sure the same thing happened there is when when you move away the rubble, you find things you didn't expect, and that's exactly what we found here. You know, and they said, well, once you open up an existing building. Who knows what you're going to find, you know? So uh, we did. We didn't find Jimmy Hoffa, but other than that, so yeah. Okay, God told us that with a mind to work, intense prayer, and the right purpose, fantastic accomplishments can be obtained in supernatural time frames. He also indicated through the power of the Holy Spirit, the walls of the soul and spirit can be rebuilt in 52 days. This is what making Jesus Lord of your life is all about, allowing Him to join His supernatural touch to your committed effort, releases miraculous power to accomplish important work. It does not matter if you've lived a certain way for days or decades. God wants his temple, you, protected and prospering. Are you ready to go? I wrote down here, I'm supposed to read ne Nehemiah 6.15, so let me turn there and see what it says. Oh, yeah, well, it's just, it's just a statement. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help, help of God. Wasn't that a cool thing? Wouldn't that be neat to see that happen in your life, to see God do some great things, to see things shift in your life? So I think that'd be very exciting. Amen? Amen. All right, any questions yet? Yes, Mike. It was, it was just a season, like a month. 
Yeah, that's in uh, Nehemiah 6.15. You can look that up. Mary. No, that's a very good question. Um, what we're going to see, she, there was there's three temples that have been built, and, and, and I'm pretty sure this is right. Solomon's temple was spectacular. This temple, which is the temple that was essentially reconstructed by Zerubbabel, um, it, it's, it was a very modified, very small expression of the temple. Then Herod, who was both a Roman and a, uh, and a Jew, Herod came about 50, 60 years before Christ, and he's the one that really rebuilt the city of Jerusalem so that what we have today is called Herod's Temple. Or, or I'm sorry, not what we have today. What they'll reflect on is what's called Herod's Temple. And the rocks that you'll see that are actually under the uh, what's now called, the, there's, two, there's two mosques up there right now. There's the Dome of the Rock and there's al Akba. And uh, so, but the, but the base of that are, <clears throat> are the big limestones that were laid at Herod's time. Or maybe, I think they're late at Herod's time. So and we'll make sure we get there that that's right. But I'm pretty sure that's right. Yeah. She's going to Israel with us in about six weeks. So I know you're not going to be here the last week because neither am I. You know, so John's going to fill in for me. And he's, he's taught it. He'll, he'll do a great, great job. So, okay. You guys are all good? Okay. So let's turn to uh, page 10. P- this week... As I mentioned, is all about foundations. Say foundations. foundations. Okay. Um, if, I, if, if I'm wrong about this, Keith, just let me know. You can come up and correct it. But my understanding is the taller that they're going to build a structure, the deeper the foundation has to go, the deeper, and I'd assume, I'd assume wider. I mean, that's, I think that's essentially a, a building principle in terms of the foundation. And so when I talk about foundations, you might think, hey, I've been there, I've done that, I don't want to do this again, this is elementary stuff. Well, first of all, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on foundational things. But the truth of the matter is, if you want to build something that you haven't built before, you're going to have to go deeper than you've, than you've gone before. And, and you can't build anything. Hi, guys. There goes all your kids. Uh, <laughs> nobody's with them. We just kind of lock the doors of the church and say, kids, you know, have fun. Some candy over here. And uh, so it's okay. If they leave, we can reopen it back up. Or maybe we should open that one. Um, so foundations are very, very important. And I hope you'll embrace this week. And I hope the simplicity of the week will be reassuring to you in many ways. Uh, one of my favorite stories about foundations is a sports story. So indulge me for just a moment. Um, the uh, Probably the most highly regarded basketball coach of all time is John Wooden, who coached at UCLA and just passed away this past May at 99 years old. He lived a long, successful life. And and uh, but one of the stories that his players would tell is 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 absolutely true and correct. He would say every single year, every year, and and it, when kids went to college and in those years when he was coaching, you would go for all four years. There was no such thing as leaving early to go to the pros. You just it just didn't happen. Thank you, Amanda, so much. Um, you just didn't do that. You stayed all four years. So all four years, every season would start off this way. Is he, and, and they had the they had the most successful basketball program in the nation, probably in history, but certainly in the nation at that time. And every year, his first his first teaching with the world's best collegiate level basketball players is he would teach them to put on their socks, their socks. And after they got their socks on correctly, because he, he wanted the, the rib that goes along the toes, he said, you have to get that exactly right, or you're going to get blisters. And if you get blisters, you can't play on the court. And then after he taught them that, he would then teach them how to lace up their tennis shoes and to make sure they were the exact right tension on their feet, all to keep them playing on the court so that they didn't get blisters. And then he'd hold up a basketball and said, gentlemen, said, this is a basketball. And he would teach them how to do simple, simple things. And the team won 10 national championships in 12 years, which is unheard of. I mean, there's almost no way to even fathom how something like that would happen. But it started because he was a great teacher, and he would teach fundamentals or foundational principles. 
And so if this feels a little too uh, uh, much of a rerun for you, just see it as a refresher course and revisiting things. So foundations are very experienced. Matter of fact, I just told you the story and I had written it in the book there. So um, let's talk then first about on page 11, what day one is. There are five lessons uh, in this week. Uh, days three and four are together and um, six and seven are together. There's five basic lessons, okay? Okay, now day one is about your salvation assured and secure. So the verses that you're going to study on page 12 are all about the assurance of your salvation. By the way, the third verse down where it says John 5, 12 through 13, that's 1 John. So put a number one right in front of there or you'll never find it. Okay? It's the third verse down on page 12. There's Revelation 3.20, and then there's Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and then the third reference is John 5, 12 through 13. Put a number one there because it's actually 1 John. So you know there's the Gospel of John right after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but then right before Revelation, a couple pages for Revelation, are the three letters of John. So it's 1 John chapter 5, verses 12 through 13. So the first day is all about this, the 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 reality that your salvation, your eternal soul, when you give your life to Jesus, is assured and secure. If you're here tonight, and you're not absolutely sure what would happen to you if God took you home tonight, I want to let you know that if you have confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you don't need to worry about that. Excuse me. You don't need to worry about that anymore. It is absolutely set in eternity by him. When you confess Jesus as your Lord, when you give him your life, the Bible says that he opens up the book of life and he writes your name there and he doesn't write it in pencil and, he's, and he doesn't wait with white out to see what you do wrong. That's not how it works, men and women. So that doesn't mean that you can just say some sort of magic thing and say, all right, Jesus is my Lord and think you just live your life anyway. I'm talking about when you've truly given your life to Christ, your name is written in the book of life and you're going to be with him forever. So, so if every time we do an altar ministry, you feel like, man, I better go up there. I'm not sure I'm going to make it to heaven. That's more of an insecurity probably on your part, or it's a lack of understanding of what the Word says in terms of the, the security of your salvation. Now, part of this point here grows out of my background. This may be no issue to you guys at all, but I grew up in my background. I grew up in a very fundamental, fantastic church, and, uh, and even my own grandma, who, who grew up in the same uh, same sort of church, church, Christian Church, Church of Christ, uh, fantastic churches. Uh, my own grandma, at, at, at around the time when she was quite elderly, wasn't ever quite sure she was going to heaven. Matter of fact, in our church, quite often, you know, the more you went forward, the, the better it was, you know. And, and, um, and there, wasn't that, there wasn't that assurance and that confidence that what God has done in your life is absolutely settled and secure. And when there's not that confidence, what I found is that there, there's an insecurity in God's love. And I don't want you to be insecure about God's love in your life. I want you to be secure, confident, know that you're going to spend eternity with him and look forward to it. I know there's a lot of people that don't want God in their life, and so they're not going to be with him in eternity. They don't want him here. They're not going to enjoy it in heaven. That's just the way it is. You know, if you don't like God here, what makes you think you're going to like, like God in the afterlife, you know? And I think most, most people who think they don't like God is because they don't understand it, and they haven't responded to his expression of love, but that's a different story. So this week is all about, uh, that one study is about you being confident. Now, if you're here tonight and you're not sure you've ever invited Jesus in your life, before I leave tonight, come up and grab me. Say, Pastor, I think I'm that, that person that you talked about because I don't want you leaving tonight. Because if you're this hungry for God and you're not sure about that, let's settle it tonight. I'll pray with you. It'll be done. You know, you can go get a tattoo if you want and say, Jesus is my Lord, you know. And so you can always look at it, you know, and put a little heart around it. gosh. Jesus has tattoos. Did you know that? Jesus had two, too. I think he does, seriously. Because when he's coming back, it says on his right thigh is printed, King of Kings and Lord of Lords in Revelation. So I think it's a tattoo. I'm just kidding. You guys settle down a little bit. 
just kidding. I just lost Jerry. I remember my daughter said she's going to get a tattoo. We were in Hawaii having a family vacation about six or seven years ago, about passed out. You know, I just couldn't believe it. But if you have tattoos, more power to you, but they're not for me. Um, okay, so, so, so the, first, the first lesson is all about the assurance of your salvation. And if you're not confident about that for any reason, um, uh, grab whoever you came with and say, would you just pray for me? I want to settle this. Because you, 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 you have to know in your heart that it's done. And then these verses uh, will help you. So when you do your study here, it's a real easy study. You read the verse. You say, read the following verses and write the main truth reflected. If Revelation 3.20 is, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man comes in, comes, uh, opens the door, I will come in, and I will be with him. I will sup with him. It depends which uh, translation of the scripture you, you read, which is Jesus's promise to come into your life. So there's the answer uh, to answer to the first one right there. Okay, so it's very simple, very sh- straightforward things, but trying to internalize biblical truth. Does that make sense? You guys all good on this? Okay. Okay, number day number two. Okay, after you do that, the day number two is once you know you're saved, the second thing that you need to get is that you have a new identity, all right? I call it God's Witness Protection Program. God's given you a new identity. I don't care what people have said about you, how, how, what, what has been prophesied over you, spoken over you, what you've lived under. But when you come to Jesus and give yourself to him, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says you are a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. That doesn't mean that, that they've been refurbished and kind of glossed over and, and, uh, and pre-owned and certified and all that kind of stuff. The Bible Bible says, no, you're new. You're brand new in him, and you have a new identity in him. Some people, some of you, if, if some of you, when you get just this point, it will change your life for the rest of your life. Once you understand that you're a king's kid, that Satan has no right to you, has no right to the things that you have dominion over, once you get that, it starts to change everything in your life. So just understanding that in Christ you have a new identity might change life for some of you. And so uh, uh, the action points on that on day, on day 14 are very similar to the days before, okay? So first day is assurance of salvation. Second day is your new identity in Christ. The third day, is, which is the third lesson, which is days three and four, is all about spiritual breathing, spiritual breathing. Everybody just breathe in. Breathe out. Okay, now, so we're all very conscious of that, but the reality is you've been breathing 12 to, four times, four, 12 to 14 times a minute. Unless you have some sort of respiratory challenge, you probably haven't thought about it at all. My father, who's going to come down in, in a couple weeks, uh, one of the things he faces is um, uh, congestive heart uh, disease or congestive heart failure. So breathing for him is hard, and it's exhausting. <laughs> it's exhausting to not know if you can breathe. You know, I mean, because, but we all do it, all you guys, we all do it easily and, and audit, we're not even thinking about it, you know. And um, we breathe in what? We breathe in oxygen, right? We breathe in carbon dioxide, is that right? And breathe out carbon dioxide, okay, whatever. So we breathe in oxygen, we get rid of the bad stuff, all right? And, um, uh, and it's very much the same way in your spiritual life is that I want to encourage you to consider um, a practice that we call spiritual breathing, which is to breathe in the good things of God and get rid of the crummy things. And instead, most of us keep the crummy stuff. You know, it gets in us, it gets on us, it stinks. You know, we're carrying it around. Everybody else sees it. We think we're hiding it. Think some makeup will cover it. You know, and none of that stuff works. The reality is, is that you just got to get rid of that crummy stuff. You know, and as if you can get your spirit to start to do that as automatically as your uh, respiratory system works, you're going to be way ahead of the game, you know. So, I mean, since sometimes you just got to learn to shake that stuff up. So we, we breathe in the fullness of the Holy Spirit and breathe out. We exhale the things of sin. We confess. Now, the way you do that, then basically say, you breathe in the goodness of God and say, God, you know what, I'm sorry that you just, you just confess. Say, God, I'm sorry that I've, that I've, wasn't listening to you, didn't do this thing, allowed myself to think this way, say, say that, this or that. You just breathe those things and get rid of them right away. The Bible says that he is faithful and just to forgive us from all unrighteousness, right? All of it. He's going to, and you need to get it out of you. So that's all about um, spiritual breathing. 
If you've ever heard that concept before, just kind of wave at me. You ever heard about spiritual breathing? Okay, several of you have. Which one is it? That's beautiful. Sure, sure, absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot of pretty songs. Okay. Um, and so your day three action point is um, just, it's just one section of Scripture. Your day four action point is another section of Scripture, which is really uh, Psalms 51 on page 17 is really is David's confession of his sin and what he did with it. And uh, the uniqueness of King, King David is just remarkable, just the uh, incredible ability to have a heart for God. And even when he, when he strayed as bad as any of us can imagine straying, something brought him all the way back to a hunger for God, which is phenomenal. Okay? So first day is about the assurance of your salvation. Second day is about your new identity in Christ. The third and fourth day is about spiritual breathing. These are all foundational things that will start to get your, your structure of your life, the footing of your life uh, in the, going the right way. Day four is, day five, I'm, sure, I'm sorry, is about the importance of reading the Word of God. Day five's title, When All Else Fails, Read the Instructions. <laughs> I read, read a short uh, joke or something. It was kind of just... That about a guy and his wife that had bought a new uh, appliance, or I, I think it was maybe it was a lawnmower, and uh, so they pulled it all out of the box and started to put it together and all this kind of stuff. They finally got stuck, so they opened up the the uh, directions to put it together, and the first line of the directions said this: "said Now that you've decided to read the instructions," which I thought was kind of funny, you know. <laughs> And uh, the Word of God here, the Word of God is our instruction manual. It is how we're going to live our life. And we want you to live the Word, learn the Word, love the Word of God. And so this day is all about, all about uh, studying the Word of God. Now, you're going to look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, Hebrews 4, 12, Joshua 1, 8. Those are three great verses about the power of the Word. Then... Um, I'm going to encourage you to memorize one of those verses above there, okay? Pick one of those. So if you're smart, you'll pick the short one. When you figure it's probably Hebrews 4.12 is probably the shortest one. I'm just, you remember which, memorize whichever one you want, and uh, do your very best to try to memorize those things. Now, um, Psalms 119 is the longest chapter, right below that, is the longest chapter in the Bible, um, and it's a beautiful chapter, and, and if you can't read all the way through it, you know, if you just, you know, I'd rather have you do the f stuff up above it first, but, um, but Psalms 119 is all about the power of the Word. It's a beautiful psalm. Every single line is about, about why the Word is important to our life, and you could probably read the first 10 verses and, and answer three important things about the power of the Word in our life. So that's all about reading the Word. Got it? And day six is about prayer. All right, day six is about prayer. We will revisit prayer. Matter of fact, I probably will have Sherry come teach that week if she will, because she does the teaching on prayer uh, in about week four. But uh, but uh, really encourage you guys to begin talking to God on a regular basis. So let me just say a couple things real quick. When you pray, when you should pray, there is no sort of official language that you need to use. I hear some people say it's supposed to be Spanish, but I don't know Spanish. Um, what I mean, there's, there, you don't have to pray. You don't have to pray in certain sort of words. You know, you don't have to use these and thous, and uh, you don't have to, uh, in, in, in what I guess would be called King James English or Shakespearean sort of style sort of language, you know. Um, I think when you pray, you're coming to the God. I think there is a sense of reverence and awe, but, but you've got to talk to him. You've know, you got you to gotta communicate with him. And as you pray and as you start to open yourself up to God, also take some time just to be quiet before him as well, too. And that might feel kind of goofy to you. And the minute you start being quiet, your mind starts to just fill in all the blanks, but your mind will eventually kind of calm and settle down, and, and, you, and, and you will start to sense uh, an increasing awareness of God if you'll do that. So, so, but you've got to talk to the Lord, okay? And then there's two sections of Scripture. You're going to read the Lord's Prayer, and then also Philippians 4, 6, and 7. And on uh, day 7, so next Wednesday, or you can do it, yeah, next Wednesday when you come here, before you come here, you're going to finish day 7 here, which is you're going to talk about what assurance of salvation means to you, what, your, what identity in Christ means to you, what spiritual breathing is, what reading the Bible does for you, daily prayer. You're just going to write a sentence on each of those, and then you're going to write a prayer out to God. So that's your week.
Yes? All right. So those are the foundational things. And then next week we're going we're gonna to go into what we call spiritual battle and um, challenge in some of those. I think you'll, think you'll love that as well. So, okay. Are you guys all right? Yes? Okay. Any questions yet? So there's a daily exercise. Uh, it's everything from as simple as just reading a scripture passage and reflecting on it to memorizing a verse. Uh, uh, that's the simple, simple things this week. And, um, uh, and then just come and, and be ready to go. So you got your books. Leanne? Tomorrow's day one. Yeah, it's too late tonight. But for some of you that are a little OCD, uh, I'm sure you've already done with the first week. You know, you've been working on stuff ahead of time, and you've already found the mistakes. You know, there's about three mistakes in the book. And uh, I pointed out one to you. The others, you guys will find the other ones probably. So, uh, okay. Yeah, so we'll start day one tomorrow. So that means then Wednesday. Or you can do it today. It's really, it's pretty easy. So I, I already talked you through most of it. So, so read, read the introductions. Reflect on it, do your study, and, uh, and just start to spend time with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Okay.